Good morning. Welcome to Colton View United Methodist Church. I'm Bruce Craig, and I'll be the liturgist this morning. I just have a few opening announcements. First, if you can fill out your pew and pass it down the pew, we'd like to register your attendance this morning in the pew pad. And also, um, if you see anyone that you haven't seen for a while, please drop their name down so we can make sure to reach out to them as well. Pastor Barbara is conducting a study on Israel on Sundays at the Horizons Campus at 6 p.m. This evening, Reverend Jim and Kim Goddard will also be helping to lead the Bible study. You can pre- please bring in individually wrapped candy and place that near Catherine's office for the Trunk or Treat event that will take place on Wednesday, October 19th in our parking lot from 6 to 8 p.m. And so we thank you for any of those donations of uh, candy. The preschool will be holding their silent auction on Sunday, October 23rd. Please help this ministry out by donating a basket, baked goods, or handmade items for the auction. And then finally, a mission celebration will take place on Sunday, October 16th at 5 p.m. That will be kicked off by a barbecue meal, and then uh, that will have all the fixings. That will be in the Family Life Center, and then presentation to follow. Those are all the printed announcements I have. Are there any others? Hearing and seeing none, let us worship. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand and join together for our opening hymn this morning. Hymn number 452. My faith looks up to me. Please rise. join with me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
come to this time of morning prayer, let us hear these words from Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So with that in mind, are there requests that you would like to lift up amongst the church body this morning? Tower. And there are others. I have some names that were mentioned here Blake Eads, Tim Pickle, Blake McKinney, the Hurricane Victims, Wesley Kidd, Jane Martin, Jim and Denny Cook, Barbara Griswold, Rhonda and Daryl Davenport, Kathy Matthews, Helen Bryan, John Walsh, and Judy Sullins. Just keep those our minds and in our prayers this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. We'll start with silent prayer and I'll lead us in corporate prayer. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for just the opportunity to be here in your house this day. We're grateful to join together as a body to worship and glorify you. And we welcome your spirit in our midst this morning. We bring our gratitude, our prayers, and petitions to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers, and we simply seek your grace and mercy this morning. There are many spoken and unspoken concerns that have been raised here. Lord, we simply ask that you'll respond in ways which bring glory to your kingdom. There are many on our hearts who are dealing with illness, strife, and loss. We pray for healing, relief, recovery, and comfort as you hold your children in the palm of your hand. For those that are experiencing a time of bereavement, we ask that you especially draw close to them, that they may experience your peace. Please also be with our shut-ins and those that cannot be with us this morning. Be with our healthcare workers and first responders that are serving the needs of their neighbors. We also thank or are thankful for the service of those who have sacrificed for the freedoms that we have here in our country to worship you today. Be with our veterans. Be with their families. Lord, we also pray that you'll be here amongst the, our world. There's many conflicts and persecution, Lord, and there's the great need for peace. You call us to be a people that are set apart, living not for the acceptance of this world, but living for eternal residence in your kingdom. We ask that you'll be beside us as we seek to live out our heavenly calling. We're thankful for the change in seasons and the beauty that is slowly being unveiled to us with the tapestry of all colors that you paint in our midst. Help us to pause and experience the awe and wonder of your creation. And we thank you for this blessing. Lord, this morning in your scripture, you remind us of your healing power that's accessible to those who have faith. Bolster our faith and help us to recognize your healing touch in our lives. More importantly, that we may respond in thanksgiving and gratitude. Draw near to Barbara this morning as she brings the message that you've laid upon her heart and open our hearts to receive it, and most importantly, that we apply it. We ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
our best day, we are a child of you, and on our worst day, we're a child of you. Every day is a good day because of you. It does not matter about the rest. If we have you, we are blessed. Help us not to forget how blessed we are. We offer these gifts in thanksgiving as a token of the rich blessings that flow from you. Take, use, and multiply these gifts to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I brought something this morning. A what? A card. A card? What kind of card? What does it say? Thanks. Thanks. It's a thank you card. Now, have you ever um, sent a thank you card? Write a little note on it. Yeah? You stick it in the envelope. And you put it in the mail. Yeah? Why would we write a thank you note? Uh, like, if they come to your birthday. So somebody comes to your birthday party? Okay, why else would we write a thank you note? Uh, give gifts. When people give us gifts. And if... Right, good job. Now, why? So those are some reasons we would send a thank you. What does it mean to be thankful? It is a way to be nice. It shows that we appreciate something that someone has done for us, right? We are thankful for the time that person gave us, right? Or a gift. So this morning, we're going to talk about being thankful. In our scripture lesson, there are there are these ten gentlemen. Well, we think they're boys. We don't know. So they're and they're they have a disease called leprosy. That's an excellent question, James Preston. Leprosy is a sickness when you get sores all over your body and your skin gets all gross and they would wrap themselves up and they kind of look like mummies sometimes but it was really contagious so if you had leprosy you couldn't be around anybody otherwise you'd give it to them so these don't you think that'd be awfully lonely yeah so these ten lepers were were out and Jesus walked past them and you know what they did they yelled at him, Jesus, Jesus, will you heal us? Because do you think they wanted to have leprosy? No, it sounds pretty awful. And you know what Jesus did? He healed them. Boom. Oh, their leprosy was gone. He just told them they were healed. And they were so excited. They ran off to celebrate. And then one of them goes, oh. I should probably say thank you. And he goes back and he finds Jesus and he tells him thank you. Only now, one. what? Only one. Yeah, only one of them said thank you. Not two. Not two? Yeah, not two? Not three? What about the nine others? Should they have said thank you? Yeah, because we need to remember to be thankful to people that do kind things to us, but also to God. Because does God give us blessings? And he, he takes care of us, right? Okay. Hey, maybe we should be thankful right now. You think we should pray and thank God right now? Let's do that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. We love you, Lord. Amen. morning. For those of you I have never met, 
Uh, my name is Barbara, and uh, I'm known around the house as uh, back home as Bobby, and um, I have to know that God still knows me as little Bobby Ballard from Ballard's Branch. But I, I welcome you this morning, as, as Bruce did, to this time of worship at Pleasant View. As the leaves turn and excite us and the air is nippy and frost is on the roof, we know that change is coming and change is inevitable. I would ask you to pray for, for Dale. He's, he's got a, a stomach virus that's been going around in the church this week, and he, he is not here for that reason to, to worship with us. So remember him, and also remember all the rest of us that work here that um, will be able to escape such a, such a fate. I would ask if you would stand as we read the scripture this morning. I'm going to be reading from the 17th chapter of Luke, verses 11 through 19. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God! He fell, <clears throat> he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? <clears throat> where, <clears throat> excuse me, where are the other nine? Has no, <clears throat> no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say together, and before you sit down, I want you I want you to turn to somebody and, and not only say hello, but ask, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? Where are the nine? <laughs> Thank you all. <clears throat> I've been battling my, my voice coming and going, and I, I please don't pray that it'll go and stay, stay dumb. But I, I appreciate your prayers. You know, there there is a, a an Old Testament um, basis for for today's scripture, and it's found in Leviticus thirteen one through three and 44 through 45, and I would like to read that to you. If you want to turn to Leviticus, I did not give this to Kathy in time to get it on the overhead. So if you would, just listen, and I won't ask you to, to stand again. But this, this is uh, Moses and Aaron having to deal with some very serious issues out in the wilderness when, when those guys were in, in that ragtag, group that, that Moses was responsible for, the, the, the hundreds of thousands of, of the Hebrew people who were out there with him. And, and when, a, when a, an outbreak would occur that would be contagious, they had to deal with it and figure out what to do. So regarding serious skin diseases, um, I'm reading from Leviticus 13, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, if anyone has a swelling or a rash or discolored skin that might develop into a serious skin disease, that person must be brought to the must be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons. The priest will examine the affected area of the skin. If the hair in the affected area has turned white and the problem appears to be more than skin deep, it is a serious skin disease, and the priest who examines this examines it, must pronounce the person ceremonially unclean. And then verses 45 and 46. 
Those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth, sound familiar, and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. This, too, is the Word of God for the people of God. You know, um, I, I guess I hadn't really, really considered the, the chilling uh, similarity between COVID restrictions and uh, what we have dealt with for the last two and a half years worldwide, not just in our community or in our state or in our country, but throughout the whole world. It, it's it's uh, uncanny and um, very interesting that that our restrictions and and our terror and our fear come correlates to, to what Moses and Aaron established rules to control many 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 centuries ago. Both these diseases, leprosy and COVID, have. Um, devastating consequences. They have similar circumstances. Um, they affect the body in, in various ways. But one of the saddest realities in both conditions is isolation. The, the lepers in Jesus' time and prior to that, they were sent away, away from their families, away from their jobs, away from society. They were sent outside the camp. They were sent to live in, in communities, in their own communities, with others um, infected and affected the same way they were. They had to live separately. And with COVID, for a period of time, we were told we had to live separately. We had to socially distance. Lepers had to socially distance, stay away from other people. But the isolation that, that has just saddened me the most is those who, who have actually died in, in nursing homes and even at home, and those who, who are, <clears throat> are dealing with, with serious emotional issues even now from isolation, from being set apart from others and, and lacking human contact. I remember early on, when, when COVID was, was really becoming quite a problem and, um, and it, uh, somebody came to me before Easter and said, Barbara, uh, looks like we're going to have to cancel the, the Easter breakfast, sunrise breakfast. And I said, oh, don't, don't get excited. You know, that's two weeks away. Well, hello, that was two and a half years away. But that, the isolation that we experienced, I remember... Our, our neighborhood just suddenly it was just like like everybody had been uh, captured and taken away. There were no people, there were no cars. But my daughter and I would would walk through the neighborhood when I lived in Tennessee with her, and it, and we remarked, you know, nobody's outside even breathing the air because they're even afraid of the air. But as we were walking one Saturday morning, it was a beautiful. Uh, it was a beautiful Saturday morning. It was probably in, in March or April, you know, when the shutdown had, had first happened. And a, a man and his wife in a convertible. And that, on that cold, cold day, they had the, the top down on the, on the convertible. It was a white Corvette, an older model Corvette. And they were driving through the neighborhood. The man had a, a handlebar mustache, beautiful white hair. And they stopped. And he said, glad to see you ladies out. He said, you know, we had to get out of the house or we were going to kill each other. The isolation that we experienced and those who were most affected were those who were, who were isolated already in nursing homes and, and various places like that. Some of them died from failure to thrive just because of the lack of human interaction. So while both are similar, both are very different. We know the effect of leprosy. Even today, leprosy has its effect. Some areas of, of the world still experience the devastating effects of leprosy. 
I was listening to to one um, speaker just this past week. I, I, I was just in doing research. I, I found a speaker talking about the leprosy incidents in India now, and and how devastating it is, and how whole communities have been affected. Its effect on the body is devastating, as Catherine was telling the children. And it's, it's horrible, and, and it's something that, that we don't like to discuss before we're thinking about going back in the fellowship hall, maybe having a snack. But its effect is horrible. Where it attacks, it causes a loss of the sense of touch. It, that doesn't sound too bad, but consider those implications. If, you're, if you can't feel anything, if you, if you have no sense of touch, and you pick a, a, a wrought iron skillet up a hot, hot skillet off the, off the stove and you can't feel it, you don't know that your hand is being seriously burned. And you might carry that over to, the, to a hot plate and put it down and part of your skin comes off as you let go of the, of the handle of the band. Now, if you had leprosy, you wouldn't feel anything. You've lost your sense of touch. You've lost your, your awareness of pain. I remember when, when my husband's diagnosis of catacil was finally reached. Um, uh, the symptoms had been present for many, many, many years. But after, when he was finally diagnosed, the, the disease had progressed enough that the symptoms were very, very obvious and very noticeable. And one of his symptoms was he did not feel pain. He experienced the terror of heights, and he had always been a climber. We'd hiked all over the place, but he was scared to death of heights, but he didn't feel pain. And he, he had chronic kidney stones from the time we were married. It was rushing to the ER in the middle of the night with a kidney stone attack. And he, as time progressed, he was in a wheelchair, and one of our members here at the church was in the hospital in Charlottesville, and I, uh, she had surgery, and I wanted to go visit her. And, of course, Connie Mack wanted to go, too, start the car, and he's ready to go. So we're, we're traveling up 81, and, and we get um, about halfway to Charlottesville, and we stop for lunch. And I've, I've got him seated at a table, <clears throat> and everything's fine, and then all of a sudden he just he grabs his side. And that's always a, a cue to me to, oh boy, something's going on here. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, kidney stone. And I said, are you okay? Because I know what a kidney stone attack would result in in this man. I've been through it too many times. And he said, I'm fine, fine. So we finish eating. We go on to Charlottesville to the hospital. And we are coming back and we get to Marion. <laughs> and it wasn't fine. So... Uh, I'll skip the details, but I made a mad dash with that man to Abingdon to the hospital to get him admitted because he was finally feeling some pain when he got to the excruciating point. And you folks, particularly you guys who have had kidney stones, you know what I'm talking about. You know that, that excruciating pain. And for those of us who have not had kidney stones but have given birth to children, we know the point of excruciating pain. Lepers cannot feel that pain. So they have live in colonies away from the general population. They've lost their family connections. They've lost their means of making a living. A man can no longer hold his wife in his arms or pick up his children, his, um, his son or his daughter. You know, life to a leper has little meaning. And there's, at that time, there was no medical treatment. Lepers lived a miserable life. They were under an unmistakable death sentence until by some, unless by some miraculous occurrence, they were healed. They conquered the disease. The disease didn't beat them, but they beat the disease. And lepers tended to roam together. They were looking for food. They were begging. They, they begged at a great distance because they were required to to cover their faces, put a mask on, and call out, I am unclean. Don't come near me, I'm unclean. 
They learn to yell in loud voices. That's from the need to warn others and to beg for them to help, like you're at the back of the room and I'm begging you, help me. Lay some food down on the floor and go away and I'll come pick it up. What would it have been like to have been removed from friends and family for a lifetime and to have to be forced to announce that fact on a daily basis? It must have been horrible. We cannot imagine the horror of life. And yet, in this particular account, in Luke 17, we see ten men who have in, who are encountered Jesus and hear him say in the most unusual way. Is when they see him, they know who he is. And they start yelling, Master, Master, have mercy on us. We, we want to be well, they scream to Jesus. The local priest had duties other than leading worship on each Sabbath. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that has changed, that they and I are not responsible for, for your phys- examining you to see if you're physically um, well. But, but the duty of a priest in, in Jesus' day was, other than leading worship on Sabbath, they were also something of a health official. They were the local health department. So then when they see Jesus and they know who he is, he says, go and show yourself to the to the priest. And as they turned in obedience to go, they were healed. They were healed on the way. Maybe they thought that was a little odd that Jesus just spoke to them and told them to go because they knew who he was and maybe they knew about the leopard in Luke 5. And I'll read that to you, the fifth chapter of Luke, the 12th through the 14th verses say, in one of the villages, another unnamed village, if you didn't pay any attention when we were reading the scripture to start with, that Jesus was in a village, an unnamed village, uh, when the ten had had come to him. So here in, in chapter 5, there is another unnamed village. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. Jesus said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. The healing of the ten leopards, Jesus doesn't reach out and touch them. He, does, he only says, be healed. He, he, he doesn't say be healed. He tells them to show, go show yourself to the priest. Entirely different method of healing that Jesus does. And in faith, the ten started out. Now what if, what if these guys knew each other? What if by some chance they might even been from the same leper colony? Maybe the ten knew about the one, the one leper who had been healed. And maybe they paused to question that. But nonetheless, they turned, all ten of them, turned and followed Jesus' instruction to go to the priest. But just one came back and praised God and was grateful. And Jesus said to him, Where are the nine? He tells the leper who came back, Your faith has made you well. In King James, that is, Your faith has made you whole. Ten were healed, but only one was made whole. You know, that's far, being made whole is far more important and, and is much more huge than just being healed. The point made here, I think, is that unless gratitude is part of our nature, we can't be whole people. I think in, in his gratitude, in his coming back and saying thank you and falling face down on the ground in front of Jesus and saying thank you, his gratitude made him whole. 
The other nine were merely healed. If, if uh, ingratitude is more deadly than leprosy, they were in worse shape than before. Only one came back and was made whole. You know, gratitude is spontaneous. It can't be manipulated. It can't be bought. It can't be, um, you can't force it on anybody. I tried as, as a, a young mother, when I tried to instill in my children the habit of being thankful and saying thank you and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And I had one child who refused. She absolutely refused. She would not say thank you. She would not say yes, ma'am. She would not say no, ma'am, or no, sir. But she grew up to be a very fine human being. It was just her rebellion at Mama telling her she had to be grateful. It can't be purchased. Gratitude can't be purchased. Today's gospel rightfully casts serious doubt on the on the off giving counsel of count your blessings. One of the greatest blessings God can give, the healing of leprosy, does not guarantee either a grateful heart or an act of thanksgiving. The rivers of our gratitude are fed from the wells of a deeper source. There's a song that we sang. Now we now thank we all our God. Uh, there's the history of that ancient hymn, a hymn written back in the 1600s, and one that uh, Bach uh, put to music was written by a a Lutheran priest by the name of Martin Rinkert. He wrote it at, at, at close to the end of the European 30-year war. Now, that's, that's a war that we don't study about very much, but it was a, a war that, for over a period of 30 years, that eventually included every country in, uh, in Europe. And particularly hit hard was a small town in Germany. It was called Eilenburg in Saxony, Germany. It was a walled city, and during during the the war, the the, the Swedes were were uh, occupying the country. It's kind of like Russia and uh, Ukraine right now, and folks were fleeing to this little town. To it was a walled city, so they were fleeing there to seek safety from the fighting. But soon the town became full, overcrowded. And the food was in very short supply. So then a terrible famine hit. And following the terrible famine was a horrible plague. Then El- Ellenberg became a giant morgue. The estimates that I've, I have read are as many as 8,000 persons died in that city. In one year alone, this Pastor Rankert conducted funerals for 4,500 persons, including his own wife. The war dragged on, the suffering continued, yet through it all, Rinkard never lost courage or faith. He never got the plague. He never tired of helping. I'm sure he got tired, but he continued to help those. Even during the darkest days of Eilenberg's agony, he was able to write this hymn that we sang just a few minutes ago. Now we thank, now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way. You know, that was from the time we were born with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. We did not sing verse 2, but I want to read it to you. O may this bounteous God through all our life be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, and keep us in his grace, and guide us when perplexed, and free us from all ills in this world and the next. Pastor Reinhardt knew what a grateful heart meant. And this great, great hymn of our church is, is proof positive that he, he, lived in a, he lived a life of gratitude. One, le- one leper 
hated the spies Samaritan, was thankful and came back. The Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Um, I'm told, and, and when we were in Israel a couple of years ago, we were told and, and shown of a Samaritan village where, where the, uh, the majority of Samaritans live in a protected place, a, a, a settlement, a small settlement up on the um, side of the hill and another smaller uh, settlement elsewhere. But I'm, I'm told that there are only 800 Samaritans still alive in, in the world today. At one point in the early 20th century, there were only 114 Samaritans. But today, there are around 800. Not as despised as they were then. Accepted into the community of of mixed faith uh, like they were not before. But you know, guys, think about it. We are all lepers of a sort. We don't have the skin disease. Um, not all of us have had uh, really, really bad abouts with COVID. Some of us have, and some of us have lingering effects from that. We all have a leprous condition called sin. I'm infected by it, and so are you. If you're alive, you have the you have the leprosy of sin hanging on you, and it's Jesus' words that tell us, say to us even today, as He did to those to those ten, be healed, go and be healed. That's that's still His His admonition to us today to be healed. In order to be whole, and one of the one of our paths toward healing is is pure and simple gratitude, living a, a life of gratitude and a life of thankfulness, no matter what happens. And that that's hard, my friends. I know that. I I, I know what it's like to try to be thankful for loss. I know what it's like to try to be thankful in the midst of betrayal when you have been horribly betrayed. I know what it's like to, to be the one who, who, as a child, is feels like she's on the outside looking in. I know what that feels like. And I know what just plain, old-fashioned, ordinary sin feels like. And Jesus says, I am your healer. Come to me for healing. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we are all, every single one of us, whether in this room or whether listening or watching on a, on a, a YouTube video or on the church website, we are all in the need of healing. And Lord Jesus, you are the healer. It's through the power of your Holy Spirit that you call us and woo us and heal us. So, Father, my prayer is for everyone who hears my voice that, um, that we, we, we would be convicted, that uh, we would have the understanding of knowing that we can come to you and, and be healed as, just as thoroughly and effectively and as instantly as these lepers were. So, Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here in need of, of that healing, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to that heart and that this moment would not pass before that healing takes place. I don't know how you do that, Father, but I know that you do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you stand for our closing song? Philip and Philip number 89. Joyful, joyful, we adore it. Please join us.
And now, my friends, as I have said to you before, go change the world. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? Go in peace, my dear friends. Amen. Thank you.